Hello, and welcome to Online Feeder School, a two-day virtual workshop focusing on one of the most important roles on the dairy, the feeder. My name is Betsy Hicks, and I'll uh, be walking you through the start of our program. So Feeder School is put on by Cornell Cooperative Extension Regional Dairy Specialists and Cornell Pro Dairy. The regional dairy specialists around New York State have collaborated to build content and prepare for today's school in a virtual settings. You'll hear from several of our dairy specialists over the two-day program. This virtual workshop is made possible by sponsorship from our industry. We'd like to take a minute and thank our gold sponsors, Holtz Nelson Nutrition, Balchem, Purina, Gold Star Feed and Grain, MILC Group, Chris Hansen, Wrap Nutrition, and Farm Credit East. We'd also like to thank our silver sponsors, Standard Dairy Consultants, Adiseo, Lutz Feed, Trout Nutrition, and Louis Gale and Son. If you work with these companies, be sure to thank them for their support to keep this school free. Today in day one, we'll be covering economics of feeding, monitoring dry matter, and bunk-based management. Day two's topics include feed bunk management, troubleshooting mixer wagons featuring Dr. Dr. Bill Stone of Diamond V, and safety. So because we know sitting in front of a computer for an hour and a half is hard, we've really tried to incorporate some interactive activities to help that. You'll see two things sprinkled throughout the presentations to hold your attention and help you apply the information you're hearing. The first is a scorecard uh, that you'll see throughout the presentation. There are these many checkpoints for you to grade yourself on how you're doing at your farm. Max points for each scorecard situation is five points. And the point is to give you an idea of the areas that you may need to focus on at your own farm to get better results. The second piece is feeder challenge. So when we host, host feeder school in real life, we incorporate a challenge into the demonstrations and activities there. In the virtual world, it's not going to be as much fun, but we do have two questions per section to help you apply the information to a real life scenario. You can work through these questions uh, if you're with, listening with other people on your farm. Um, and if you would like these documents sent to you so you can work through them as a team, we can certainly do that. Just feel free to reach out to any one of us. Additionally, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A box at any point during the presentations. You can also type in comments into the chat box at any point. The other dairy specialists and myself will be monitoring both of them throughout the presentations. So up next, I would like to introduce Margaret Quasdorf of the Northwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team with Cornell Cooperative Extension. She'll be covering the start of our talks with economics of feeding. Margaret, it's all you. So like um, Betsy said, I'm Margaret Quasdorf. I'm the Dairy Management Specialist for Cornell Cooperative Extension's uh, Northwest New York Regional Team. Um, I have a background in both nutrition and dairy management, and I'm planning to use experience in both of those areas today uh, to bring you both technical and practical knowledge uh, that can be applied on your dairy farms or on those in which you work. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and we will begin with some of the statistics. See if the slides will change. All right, so 36% um, of total operating costs on a dairy farm is in purchase feeds. Um, that's your grain and your protein mixes, vitamins, minerals, supplements, and additives, and also any byproducts that you might be adding to the diet. Um, and feed is the single largest expense on a dairy farm. Um, with the job of feeding taking up 7.7% of the total labor hours on the farm. Shrink, which is the loss of feed or dry matter from the bunk to the feed, from starting in the bunk and then continuing all the way to when you're feeding in front of the cows, that loss can range from anywhere from 5 to 15% um, on our New York dairy farms, though it's estimated to be a little bit higher uh, when accounting for dry matter losses in the bunk due to harvesting, packing, and face management practices. Um, we're starting to see here that with some of these numbers um, that the feeder on the dairy farm is a central person involved with each of these uh, big numbers and they carry a lot of responsibility and they play a large role in the success of a dairy farm. So in this 
can get the slides to change. Okay, so in this recent study, um, it shows, again, the impact the feeder can have on a dairy farm's profitability. This study included data from 26 farms that we would consider to be mid to large size farms here in New York. And those, cows num those cow numbers ranged from 524 to over 2,000 cows. Uh, the study looked at the average tons of feed delivered per farm per day, and that ranged anywhere from the mid 30s to near 150 tons. Um, in this study, operating costs made up 74% uh, of the total cost to feed these cows with the labor. So that's the time that it took and the number of people to do the feeding. The labor was the largest expense. With those kinds of numbers, you want to make sure that you as a feeder are doing your best work or that you as a manager or nutritionist are working with the farm's feeder to maximize effectiveness and efficiency on the farm. In this particular case, the farms that did the best, financially speaking, were the ones that had a feeder who could maximize the load size uh, to decrease the number of loads mixed per day. So in this way, the cows were still fed a high quality mixed ration, but in fewer hours. So the employee could spend uh, time completing other tasks on the farm. If you take a look at this slide containing a chart from the study, you've got tons fed per day across the top and you have the average listed there at the top and then it goes across from the first through third first through fourth quartiles uh, you can see the labor costs per day along with other operating expenses underneath that and now take a minute to think about where you are where does your farm fit in here uh, how many tons do you feed on your farm and how many dollars is that per week and think about it per year uh, when you start to add up these numbers, they tell you how important it is to have the right person with the right skills in the feeder position on your dairy farm. So why does the feeder job matter? Um, feeders play a large role in the health of the cows. As we'll learn, as we'll learn later in this course, uh, mixing a consistent feed with quality ingredients is so important to maintaining the health of the rumen and the cows. As the feeder, your actions directly impact the largest single expense on dairy farms, and that again would be the feed cost. And as a feeder, um, it's definitely a skilled employee and requires a certain degree of difficulty to balance being efficient and doing a good job. Um, a feeder, as a feeder, you're an integral member of the, of the whole farm team. And that team could include as many people as the herds people, managers, veterinary, veterinarians, and nutritionists. And it's important to remember that the feeder is an integral role that sees that's on the front lines and can report back to those other team members. So let's take a moment here and type into the chat box. Um, let's brainstorm. What factors affect feeding on your farm? Please list in the, chat, in the chat box. We'll take a few minutes to think about it and then we'll go over some other thoughts. We're seeing some answers come in like weather, load sizes. What are some other factors that affect feeding? Rain and dry matter, maintenance, labor training. Great, we're getting some good answers in here. All right, so there's a bunch of factors that can affect feeding on different dairy farms. Um, some are the ones that I mentioned, timing of delivery and milking schedule, training and timing, um, but some other ones, so the setup of the feed center, how the bunkers are laid out, how the commodity sheds are laid out, um, and also um, the floor, how, how smooth the surface is 
Are you able to drive around without bouncing feet out of your bucket, making it uh, impossible to do it in as few trips as possible? Um, the quality of your equipment that you're using, the quality of records that you have on your farm. Do you keep track of your inventory? Do you keep track of which products and which, um, which products are in your commodity bays? Um, what cuttings are in which bunk, where the, about where they are. Um, the help, the people you have working on your farm and also the quality of the, of the feeds. And we also see uh, calibrated scale come up in our chat box too. Yes, that goes along with the equipment. Okay, so when thinking about the feeder, if you're the feeder on the farm, um, there's so many factors affect how they do their job, making it one of the most important roles on the farm. So how they work together with other farm team members definitely influences how, effect how effectively the farm can perform day in and day out, as well as, it, as well as its ability to be efficient and profitable. Because so many of these areas have to do with what is fed and how it impacts cows. It's important to understand the basics of nutrition as it pertains to dairy cows um, so that your role as a feeder can be effective as possible for the farm and for the cows that you feed. So with that, next up we have monitoring dry matter. Um, this section is gonna be presented by myself and my colleague um, from South Central New York, Betsy Hicks, who you just heard from. And you can see our photos here. In this section, we're gonna be going over what dry matter is, um, forage sampling recommendations, measuring dry matter, and then adjusting forage dry matter in the diet. So um, when we talk about dry matter, we're referring to the material remaining in the feed stuff or in a feed after the water portion is completely removed. Um, the nutrients in feeds are required by the cow for maintenance, growth, pregnancy, lactation, and all the other things that the cow requires. Those are all found in the dry matter portion of the feeds. Of course, water is an important nutrient. We're not saying that water isn't an important nutrient by itself, but it's also provided separately and hopefully in a free choice manner. Um, so we focus on other nutrients when we're trying to look at the diet and balance the ration. So as you can see, here in the, in the slide, um, when you remove water, dry matter is what's left and it contains all the concentrated nutrients. Mathematically, removing the water concentrates the nutrients and puts them on a level playing field. So in this example, in 100 grams of as-fed feed, so that's feed that still contains the water portion, protein might be about 4% of that feed. But when you take away the water, it becomes 20% of the dry matter of that feed. And that dry matter amount is 20 grams after you remove the 80% water in this example. Like we said earlier, dry matter contains the nutrients in a feed or of a ration and formulating rations on a dry matter basis helps put the nutrient contents in the feed on a level playing field and helps us balance. Dry matter and silages can have or can change frequently. And so testing dry matter and making adjustments is a good way to improve the consistency of the diet that the cows are fed. So when are some of the times when it's important to test dry matter? You're gonna test dry matter whenever there is a change in forages or if you get a new commodity or byproduct in. You're gonna test dry matter either monthly or weekly. Uh, monthly is more if you have a very consistent bunker that was put up quickly and contains a lot of similar fields and then you got it all covered and put it up um, all at one time so that it's a fairly consistent and uniform feed overall. You might wanna test more often that, than that about two times a month or every other week or weekly if you have a bunker that was filled or packed over time and contains a variety of different fields, or if your nutritionist is seeing a lot of variation in the feed um, that you're feeding, you might have to test dry matter more often than that. Um, if you're going into a new cutting in the bunk, 
if you're changing from second to third cut or third to fourth, um, first to second, it, it doesn't matter, but you wanna make sure that you're testing the dry matter um, to make sure that there's not a large difference between those new cuttings. And then also the same goes if you're changing silos or bunks or into a new bag or even halfway down a new bag, there's a lot of variation um, in a lot of bag silos. So you wanna make sure that you test dry matter quite often in those. And the other ones that came up there were also um, during or after a rain or snow melt, a rain event or a snow melt, um, those are gonna add extra moisture to your feed. So you wanna make sure that you adjust appropriately. And then when you notice that there's too much or too little feed left over in the bunk, you might want to also do a dry matter test. Um, that might be an indicator that the dry matter isn't exactly what you think it is and it's time to take another sample. Put into the chat box um, any other times or reasons you might wanna test your dry matter that you found on your farms. So next we're gonna go over how to take a silage sample. Um, first of all, you're gonna make a pile of the silage. You're gonna scrape across the face so that you're collecting um, the entirety of the face. And you're gonna try and avoid the spoilage or any parts that you're not going to, that you shouldn't feed to your cows. Hopefully you've pitched those off or you're gonna pick those out later. You don't really wanna feed uh, cows spoilage, spoiled feed. Um, and then do your best to mix the pile with a loader bucket. Uh, sometimes this is hard, but if you just take a couple scoops and drop it over and on top of the part that you already dropped down as you're making it into a pile that can effectively mix it. Next, you're gonna grab your sample. You're gonna take about five to eight hand grabs from around the pile. You wanna make sure that you're representing the best you can the silage and there's a lot of feed there so you wanna do your best. You're gonna combine it in a small pail or a bucket and then take a representative sample from that bucket that you're actually going to either send into the lab to get dried down, or you're gonna do that on your farm yourself. So um, if you're not gonna take that sample and dry it down immediately, it's important to store it in a plastic bag in some place cool like a refrigerator to maintain the quality of that sample. And next we have a video here to show that procedure. Whoops. See if I can play it. Here we go. We have the mixed pile here. And you can see that I'm grabbing a couple different handfuls from different parts of the pile. Ideally, you would go around the entire pile and grab your different handfuls before mixing it up in the bucket. And mix it the best you can before grabbing your sample that you're going to actually test for dry matter. So here we are at our first scorecard. So we're gonna ask you to keep track of your points here. This um, has to do with our sampling procedure. So when samples are taken on your farm, when samples are taken on your farm, Give yourself a score of five. If you take five to eight hand samples from a mixed pile and you mix it in a bucket and you take a representative sample from that to measure from. Give yourself a score of three. If you take the correct amount of samples from the bucket of a loader, but not from the entire pile, and then you take a representative sample of that, give yourself a score of one. If you take a couple handfuls of the pile to measure and give yourself a score of zero if you don't sample your forages at all. Take a moment to score yourself there. And then we will have Betsy present the next part. All right, so I drew this short straw and I get to go over some math. So hopefully everybody um, knows what a coster tester is and has used a coster tester. Um, there's a lot of different methods we'll talk about in a little bit how we can measure dry matter. 
most recognized is the cost or tester. You plug it into the wall and you can walk away as long as it's in a safe area, right? But there is some math that we have to do and when we start in order to get good numbers, right? So first, we don't want the numbers to scare you. Just coming off of Halloween, it's a pretty scary Halloween, um, but we want to make sure you know what you're measuring. So there's three numbers you need to know. Weight A, that's your container weight. That is what you are putting your feed in. We need to know what that weight is. Weight B is what your sample is when you put it in. That is the wet sample weight, that, or we could call it the as-fed sample weight. And then there's weight C. Weight C is what, it's done, what the weight is when it's done drying. That is all the water removed. That's our dry matter or dry sample weight. So the math, this looks really scary, but it's really simple. simple. Basically line one, we're taking the container weight out of our wet sample. Line two, we're taking the container weight out of our dry sample. So we're gonna do our wet sample weight minus our dry sample weight divided by our dry sample uh, by our wet sample weight times 100, and that gives us our moisture percent. Doing it this way, it's really confusing, but when we put math to it, it makes it very simple. So our line one, our container plus our wet sample is 78. And we subtract out our container weight of nine grams. It gives us 69 grams of wet or as fed. Line two, our dry weight minus our container weight gives us 24 grams of dry weight. So when we do the math, we do 69 minus 24 divided by 69 times 100 equals 65.2% moisture. 100 minus 65 equals 34.8 dry matter. We're going to do a feeder challenge sample with this math that we can work through in a little while. But keys for success for using a coster. It's usually easiest to start with 100 or 200 grams of wet feed. It makes it much easier math. So when we get dividing out, it's just we don't. It's just simple math. Um, make sure you weigh the basket and the feed until the number doesn't change anymore. When it doesn't change anymore, it means all the water is coming out is out. If the number keeps dropping when you weigh it, it is still drying. You're going to weigh until you get the same number twice. The water is gone. Sometimes with wet feeds, it will take an hour to completely dry. So just some keys for success to keep in mind. There are some additional methods to test dry matter. So some farms use a microwave, perfectly fine. It may take eight to 10 minutes, dependent upon your microwave. Um, you should be sure to monitor that to prevent any burning of the forage it can smell pretty bad. <laughs> um, and that does require some training. We want to make sure we monitor this quite carefully if we're not sure of how our microwave is going to work. Um, we've seen some people use air fryers or dehydrators to do this. Uh, that can take up to 16 hours. It does take time um, and it's not ideal after a rain event. And big keys for this is to avoid overloading the tray. The next thing, and we've done this on corn burn down days, is using an NIR. This, we can get a read on dry matter in just a matter of seconds. Um, obviously, it costs a lot of money to get a portable NIR, um, and it requires the purchase of both the tool and the software. And we need to keep in mind, we need to calibrate these tools regularly. And then lastly is these forage probes. Um, these, we can read under a minute. They're fairly inaccurate though, and it's definitely not reliable enough for addressing uh, dry matter to make new uh, diet changes. So here's our next scorecard question. So I'll give you a minute to read through it. I'll read through it. So when it comes to dry matter, give yourself a five if your farm measures and updates dry matter weekly and when there is a triggering event. So you're gonna do both things. You're gonna update dry matters weekly on all of your forages and when there's a triggering event like Margaret talked about, whether there's a rain event, a snow melt, any of these uh, bunk changes, cutting changes, et cetera. Give yourself a three if your farm only uses or updates dry matters when they're given to you by a nutritionist, like when they take a forage sample. Give yourself a one if your farm only measures and updates dry matters when you change bunkers or silos. And Margaret is a stickler on this. Give yourself a negative one if your farm does not measure dry matter. So dry matter is super important. If we really want to dial into what cows are eating, we've got to get the dry matters right. 
So moving on to adjusting dry matters. So on a lot of farms, forage software, FeedWatch, TMR tracker, et cetera, this does it automatically when we input a new forage dry matter software. But it is still important to know how to do dry matter adjustments in case your software goes down. So a little bit of a thought process to double check what we're doing. If a feed gets wetter, we'll need to add a higher weight of feed because wetter means more water, which means more weight. If a feed gets drier, we need to add a smaller weight of feed. Drier, less water, less weight. Just a little thought process check, wetter, more water, more weight. So we're gonna work through another math example, a dry matter adjustment. So I'm gonna set the stage here. So we're about to open a new corn silage bunk. The nutritionist didn't grab a sample, but you have to address it for dry matter for a group of cows. So in the old mix, we added 4,000 pounds as fed to the mixer, and it was testing 35% dry matter to feed that group. You measure the dry matter of the new corn silage and it's 40%. What amount or how many pounds of new corn silage do we need to add to the mixer in order to keep the dry matter amount consistent? Anybody super awesome at math wanna to toss their answer in before I get going, feel free to. So let's work through this. I see a 1600. So step one, we're gonna work through this step by step. So we're gonna determine the dry matter weight of the old corn silage. So the old was 4,000 pounds times 35% dry matter. The old weight dry matter was 1400 pounds. Simple math, 4,000 times 0.35. Step two, we're gonna determine the as-fed weight of the new corn silage. So 1,400 pounds dry matter divided by 40% equals 3,500 pounds as-fed, or 1,400 divided by 0.4 equals 3,500. Remember my two double checks, because the new corn silage is drier, drier equals less water equals less weight. Than the old corn silage, you'll need to feed less as-fed weight. Just make sure this makes sense when you're working through the math. So to summarize, uh, when we monitor dry matter, dry matter is where the nutrients are in the feed, like Margaret said. Um, our accuracy of our dry matter measurement is critical for feeding. A good sample is obtained by, the following, by following the proper procedure and adjusting forage dry matter really can be quick math. So, we're at the end of our monitoring dry matter section. Here's our little scorecard recap. You can, if you feel good about your number or if you feel poor about your number and you wanna fess up to it, go ahead and type your total number into the chat if you'd like. So sampling procedure, a five was what, if you take five to eight hand samples from a mixed pile, mix in a bucket and take a representative sample. And our dry matter five was my farm measures updates dry matter weekly and when there is a triggering event. So go ahead and add your totals up I'm seeing some six. Oh, there's a 10 in there. That's excellent. Way to go. That's awesome. Um, you know, this, these two things here, it gives us, there's another 10. It gives us uh, an idea of which things we should work on in this section. So if you didn't score that great, that's good to know, right? We can work on that next time. So our first feeder challenge question is, and you can discuss this with your teammates around you or for later, we're going to go over them at the end of the day. First feeder challenge question number one, name three instances when you should sample forages for dry matter. We're going to go over the, them at the end. So if you want to type it in the chat, cool, but we can do it at the end. Talk amongst yourselves um, when you're at your farm. And then feeder challenge question number two, this one's a math one, and we will go over the math at the end of the day, like I said. Um, so the question is, it rained hard overnight and your TMR tracker software isn't working correctly and you need to make a forage dry matter correction. The corn silage piles in the system at 38 dry matter, but you just measured it to be 32% dry matter. You normally add 4,000 pounds of corn silage to the mix. How much corn silage should you add to the mix today to correct for the dry matter changing from 38 to 32? 4,000 pounds before, what should it be afterwards? So I'll give you a minute, take a picture of this with your phone if you need to, um, but we will go over it at the end of the day. So that's our second feeder challenge question for this section. 
All right, next up, we've got bunk face management and Alicia Drenke from the Southwest New York dairy team is gonna be covering this part of it. So, so before we go uh, to the next section, a question came in. Actually, it's related to uh, the part that Margaret covered, but anybody can answer it. The question is, I put nine tons in my mixer and let it mix for two minutes and pull a sample from the door. Is that a good sample as far as a four example? Who wants to answer? Margaret, do you want to answer? Or Dave, Dave, you could, I'd like to introduce Dave Belbian. He's out in Central New York team. Dave, go ahead and answer it. You're the... Uh... Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so a few things, I guess, to be a little aware of. Uh, sometimes mixers have feed left in them. So you need to be sure that the sample isn't contaminated with feed that was previously left in there. And it depends on the mixer. Uh, on uh, that two minute period of time, if that really does give you a complete mix. If it does, that would be good. But I guess I would say uh, you probably, you probably wanna take maybe more than one grab sample from the door. You probably wanna run some stuff out and take it in a few different spots just to be sure you get a good sample. So there's a lot of kind of um, moving parts there that you need to be a little bit aware, aware of. So it's not a, I guess a yes or no answer, but it kind of depends on your situation. Betsy, do you have anything to add? I'm good, Dave, if you're good. Okay, all right, thank you. Actually, I would add something. Um, sometimes our feed mixers don't always mix the way that they're supposed to be mixing. So um, if for some reason your knives aren't sharp enough or, or your, um, let's see if, there's something wrong with the distribution of the feed in the mixer, then you might be kind of artificially sorting your feed coming out or, or chopping it a little bit differently. And you might end up with um, a little bit of inconsistency that's not the same as what the original sample was. Um, some feed mixers grind the feed against the door and can actually grind up small parts and catch small particles there too. So just be careful of that and make sure that you're getting a complete sample um, that's representative of the initial corn silage when you're taking that sample. We had another question come in. Um, what's the best way to sample if you have a self-propelled mixer? That's a little different, I guess. Um, but Margaret went over the best way to mix is from a pile. Um, I suppose if you are pulling out of an upright silo, you might want to get a full pile first. Um, but if you are sampling after you've already gotten a mixer and you're not you want to avoid um, not. You want to avoid doing what Margaret just talked about. Run the whole load out and then sample along the whole length of the load. Um, so you can. Often we do this when we're doing a TMR audit, which we'll talk about on Thursday. But you want to grab from each part of that mixer. Um, so from start to finish, grab samples along that whole mix, mix in a bucket, and take your sample from that. Really important to get a good representative sample. Everything Absolutely. is based on that sample. So you need to take the time to do it right. So. Yep. Okay, thanks. All right. So now I'm going to pass the baton to Alicia Dranke. So we'll get her going. Great. So as Betsy said, my name is Alicia Drinke, and I am the dairy management specialist on the Southwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team. And I'm going to be kicking off the bunk based management section, and then Betsy is going to come back and join me. Uh, but I do also want to note that Casey Havocus on the North Country Regional Ag team worked very diligently on this section as well. Um, and you're going to get to hear from Casey on Thursday. So during this section, we're going to cover the topics of shrink, spoilage, proper face management, the value of your feed loss, as well as some inventory management. So first, let's start with shrink, which I know was briefly mentioned earlier. But just to recap, shrink is the loss of feed during harvest, handling, and storage. And these losses can occur in both ways that you can see and ways that you cannot. So visible shrink will include losses such as feed that's blown away in the wind, spoilage or spots of rot within the pile, and then decreases in dry matter intake are another form of visible shrink if you have a bunker silo 
which you can observe by seeing the height of your pile on your walls. Another form of shrink that you can see is leachate. And leachate can occur when dry matter is above 70% and it creates kind of that leaking from the bunk, which is a loss of both dry matter, but also a loss of nutrients. And this topic of leachate leads us into shrink that you cannot see. So shrink that you can't see is often a result of microbial respiration. And if you think about microbes, think about the cow stomach, right? Those little bugs that uh, are in there doing their thing. Our bunks also have those. So my microbial respiration occurs when oxygen enters the bunk. This can result in a loss of sugar, protein binding, and other nutrient losses, especially if re-fermentation occurs. Shrink can be reduced with proper face management. So we're clearly gonna wanna talk about that um, throughout the rest of this section. But typically when folks think about losses, they often think primarily of spoilage, which isn't wrong. As we just mentioned, spoilage is a form of shrink. However, it's not the only form of loss that you can occur at your feed bunk. So let's focus a little bit more on that spoilage topic though. Spoilage occurs when aer aerobic organisms break down the carbs and the silage when there's oxygen, oxygen available. So those little bugs that we just talked about, they like to eat the carbs, just like I like to eat bread and carbs, uh, when there's oxygen available in the bunk. So this can often be a result of inadequate packing or surface oxygen exposure that occurs through the plastic or the covering. We can also see this occur along the walls of a bunk when the water kind of percolates through the silage, or importantly, we can see this at the face during feed out. And this last part is extremely important as feed out losses can represent up to 30% of the total dry matter loss throughout the ensiling process. So hopefully something that you've picked up as a theme throughout these last couple of slides is that oxygen in the bunk can influence spoilage or losses. So for this next slide, you can see two images here that show us some bunk faces which are likely to experience losses. So I want to give you maybe 20 seconds to drop in some chat, it, drop in the chat some reasons that you think there might be losses. And as you start to type those in, uh, some things that stand out to me are the presence of the water in these pictures right near the feed bunk. Obviously it's standing water, um, which is not great. Oxygen exposure, is that starting to come into the chat? Great. Uh, other things that are a problem in these pictures are the uneven tire placements, uh, the fact that it's not a clean face, we see a lot of caved out areas, which adds additional space for oxygen exposure. Nowhere for the water to run off, that just came in the chat, great. And then also we see extra piles of feed pulled down that might not, might not actually be fed out throughout the day. So this is not ideal and we are likely to see losses for all of these reasons. So this next image is another example of uh, a bunk that has some issues, but maybe there's a few less alarm bells going off in your head because there's not standing water present. But as most of you just dropped in the chat and as we just learned, there's still issues, particularly with the face being pretty jagged, having caved out areas uh, and having extra space for oxygen exposure. So, if your bunk face looks like this, you might wanna consider um, some areas for improvement. So another thing that can influence the losses that are seen at the bunk is the feed out rate. And it's recommended to aim for a loss of dry matter at 3% or less. So to obtain this rate, it's important to look at your bulk density and the feed out rate of your forage. 
And if you look at the graph on the left of this slide, a bulk density of greater than 40 to 50 pounds as fed per cubic foot and a feed out rate of greater than six inches per day is needed to achieve this goal. As the amount of silage removed per day decreases, so if you're feeding out less, the forage needs to have a lower dry matter content to keep the losses under 3%. This is something to keep in mind as you evaluate your bunks and your feed out rate. And this is gonna bring us to our first scorecard question of this section. So give yourself five points if the bulk density of your bunk is 18 pounds of dry matter uh, per cubic foot or greater. Three points if it's in the 13 to 15 pounds uh, range, and then one point if it's less than 12 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot, and zero points if you don't know what your bulk density is. And remember, it's okay what you're scoring on these. These are just information for you to know where you can improve. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at the feed out recommendation topic. It should be noted that the number of inches you should feed out per day varies with the weather, and particularly it increases in warmer weather. This is true for almost all storage types, according to some research studies. So the table that you're seeing on your screen uh, presents minimum recommended feed out rates for multiple different storage systems, both in cold weather and in warm weather. And if you look at the difference of the two columns, you'll see that the feed out recommendation increases by two inches per day for nearly all types of storage system from cold weather to warm weather. And I also wanna point out that uh, at the asterisk at the bottom, not sure if you can read it on your screen super well or not, but you need a higher removal rate or a higher feed out rate if your bulk density is less than 13 pounds per cubic foot. So keep that in mind um, if you are feeding out and you're not reaching these rates uh, for your own records. So that's gonna bring us to the next scorecard question. And we wanna know what is your feed out rate, particularly in the summer? Give yourself five points if you're feeding out more than six inches per day. Give yourself three points if you're feeding out in the three to six inches per day range. One point if you're feeding less than three inches per day and zero points if you don't know what your feed out rate is. So here's a question that came through. <clears throat> what is the best way to measure bulk density? Um, Betsy, do you wanna answer that question? Let's let Dave answer it again. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> okay, so, so bulk density is really what we're looking at is the pounds of dry matter per cubic foot. Okay, so there's a few different ways that you can do it. Um, there's actually a probe that uh, I'm not sure if there's other folks, but Gary One used to, used to sell this probe that you could actually drill into the face. Uh, you could measure it, uh, weigh it, get the dry matter. And based on the volume that was in there, you could actually mathematically calculate it. Uh, there's actually some formulas based on, um, and again, it's an estimate, formulas based on um, how fast feed is coming in, the packing weight, all of those factors that will give you a predicted bulk density. The best way, I think, to actually determine the bulk density of an overall uh, bunk silo is to put a mark on the wall feed for say a couple of weeks, keep track of everything that you have fed in pounds. So you know what the dry matter is and you know the volume of that uh, feed that you removed, you can mathematically calculate it. Uh, you'd know what your as fed weight is, you'd know what your cubic uh, foot volume is and you could determine it that way. So um, several different ways to kind of come to a, to a value. There Betsy's got the tool right in front of her. Thank yeah, I actually, I, this is like one of the first days I've been in my office in a while, and I happen to have my forage probe. Um, so the big thing when you do use a forage probe is safety. We don't want to approach really high faces in order to get a bunk density, but 
when we can be safe, this is what we like to use. Um, there's a chart that we use that uh, Dairy One has put out that helps us determine it's really simple. It is normally a part of our feeder challenge when we do it in person. So that's what it looks like. But that's, that's giving you the value at that specific point. Uh, if you wanna get an overall value of the entire face, obviously it's generally gonna be less dense at the top and more dense at the bottom, typically. So um, anyway, good question. Great, thanks Betsy and Dave. So let's uh, look a little bit further at the economic value of your losses. So when we look at the value of silage management, it, it can really add up super quickly. So this is an example that we're gonna walk through for a 100 cow herd that has replacements and their hay silage value is $125 per tons of dry matter and their corn silage value is $100 or $100 per ton of dry matter. So when we look at the dollars lost for both hay and corn with good management, which is depicted in the left two columns of that table at the top, we see a total of almost $20,000 in losses. And that's with good management. If we look at the same losses, but in a situation with poor management, those losses total over $33,000. And those are depicted in those right two columns of the table. So the difference in management style of good management versus poor management can lead to a difference in economic value of nearly $14,000, which is a nice chunk of change, right? So makes, makes it really important to um, manage your bunks properly. So let's talk a little bit more about some best management practices. First, starting with your tarp and tire management. Managing the tarps and tires or weights on your bunk can greatly influence the amount of loss and spoilage that a farm experiences. You wanna make sure that you're pulling back your tarp a maximum of two times per week. You wanna weight down the leading edge of your tarp in order to decrease oxygen exposure. You wanna evenly distribute any sort of weights or tires that you have on the pile to avoid any sort of pockets of spoilage. And really your goal with this is to make sure that you're minimizing oxygen and water infiltration into the pile. So that we're not gonna have these losses that we talked about earlier. And so with this next picture, I want you to take a second to think critically about how you would manage this bunk and also how you would manage it safely. It's important to make sure that you're taking time to think critically about these types of situations and these, making these management decisions because you wanna plan for them ahead of time. Making a plan ahead of time with your entire team can help you manage this both safely as well as to the best of your abilities to make sure that you're reducing losses. It's important to have the whole team on board with your decisions and aware of whatever plans you come up with to make sure that it's both executed properly and that everybody stays safe. You shouldn't be making these decisions last minute in order to guarantee success of your plan, right? And while safety is gonna be discussed more on Thursday, I do just wanna uh, touch on it briefly because it is so important. So keep in mind when you are removing weights and tarps from your pile to deface, that you avoid the edge and don't stand too close, that you have multiple people around in case there is an emergency, that avalanches can occur at any time, but especially if there are multiple cuttings stacked on top of each other. And for this reason, you might wanna consider utilizing a tether system for anybody that is moving tarps and tires. And then also if you're on the ground, avoid standing in front of the face as any sort of avalanche and feed can obviously fall on top of you and is not going to be ending well. So you wanna make sure that you are doing some sort of self audit or self checking on your farm to know how your bunk management is doing. And there's a few different areas that you can look at to perform this sort of self audit. So first you can just take a walk out and look at your bunk or your bunk face, right? Is it hitting the areas that we talked about 
um, to make sure that we're minimizing losses. You can take some time and assess your bulk density to see if it matches up with the recommended rates. And then also make sure that you're assessing your feed out rate to see if it's uh, within the ideal range. You can also evaluate your tire and your plastic management system, see how clean they are. Do you have any random spots of spoilage, anything like that that could be improved? And then finally, take a look at your cows. Are they doing what you want them to do? Are they performing well? And then also, are they sorting out any sort of moldy or spoiled feed? This can tell you a lot about how your management is going. So I'm gonna go ahead and play another video for us. Feeder tips, defacing. Two important goals of defacing are to stay safe and keep the silage fresh. Deface straight from top to bottom to avoid avalanches. Avoid walking close to bunk face in case an avalanche does occur. Stay away from rotating parts on machinery. To keep the silage fresh, we need to prevent oxygen from getting into the bunk. Leave a smooth face to prevent spoilage. Only to face as much as you are going to feed that day. Great, so some overall goals to keep in mind as you're managing your bunk face. You wanna make sure that you're keeping a tight, straight face, that you're not pulling down any excess feed, that you're removing your cover as needed, and then you have more weights along the leading edge. And all of those goals are going to help you reduce the amount of oxygen infiltration, re-fermentation, and temperature increases that you have, which ultimately are gonna help you uh, or hopefully should help you see fewer losses in your feed. So with that, I will hand it back to Betsy to finish off this section for us. All right, thanks, Alicia. All right, we're almost in the home stretch, everybody. So again, I drew the short straw <laughs> and I get to do some more math stuff. So we're gonna be talking in this part about uh, bunk management in terms of inventory measurement and control. Make sure the slide keeps going. Okay, there we go. All right, so inventory, when we're doing volume measurements, <clears throat> Alicia talked a lot about packing density. So that is literally how much feed can we shove into one square foot, right? And we can do that by lots of weight. So the quantity of silage will vary with the packing density. The more density, the more weight we get into that little cubic foot. A low packing density, like what Alicia referenced before, that less than 13, 12 uh, pounds dry matter per cubic foot, that's really low packing density. An average packing density, we can say is about 15 pounds of dry matter per, per cubic foot. And a high packing density is over 18 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot. I have seen some farms that get 20, 22, um, but those farms are really putting in short layers, you know, low layers, really packing a lot, small layers, uh, doing an awesome job at really putting a lot of weight to that silage. So when we're doing the volume measurements, we need to know the, the density, and we've got to know uh, length, width, and height. So those are easy to measure. We know what the, the length of the bunk is or the feed in the bunk is, we know the width of the bunk, and we can measure the average height of that silage. So we're gonna use those, multiply those three things together by the density, divide it by 2000, and we'll get our tons of dry matter that is in that pile. As nutritionists, we do everything on dry matter, right? Because it gives us what we're actually feeding. Um, Farms though, farms think an ASFED, which is perfectly acceptable, that's great. But we should know how many tons dry matter is in the bunks and then we can convert it to ASFED. So to convert that, we have our tons of dry matter, what we just figured out, divided by the percent dry matter. And that gives us our tons ASFED or our wet tons that are in the bunk. 
So as an example, this is a regular upright, uh, not upright bunker, this is a regular uh, bunker silo. It's 100 feet long, it's 50 feet wide, and it's got an average height of eight feet. The density in this bunk is at 16 pounds dry matter per cubic foot, and our dry matter is 36%. So our simple math, 100 times 50 times eight times 16, equals 640,000 and divide that by 2000 and it gives us 320 tons of dry matter. That's the important number, right? That's the one we're getting at. And then dividing that by our 36% dry matter, that gives us roughly 889 tons as fed. This number, that's a good number to know, right? But we also need to factor in our shrink that happens. So we can't make our yearly inventory measurements on one number. Um, we need to know what our shrink is as well. But this is our good starting point. Um, there's a lot of really good online tools that we can use. Uh, Minor Institute has this awesome calculator we can download. Um, and where you plug these numbers in and it gives us um, the capacity in our horizontal silo, um, estimated total tons and, and how many days of silage left in inventory if you know what your usage rate is. So lots of good resources there at Minor Institute. Um, so inventory control refers to how long our forage will be made available. available. We can, once we do an inventory, we can make adjustments to feed rates so we can make that silage last longer or get through it faster. Um, some options like if we need to up or down is reduce the rate of consumption. Uh, if we ran out of a feed, we can purchase a feed similar to the one that's not available, or we can substitute a different feed. So that control tells us how long we're going to have a feed and make adjustments to make it last or get through it faster. Well, that's a, uh, a question from uh, Heather Dan at Minor Institute. Um, any uh, thoughts on using drones to uh, determine the volume in bunker silos? Yeah, so drones have been up and coming with with determining how much is in a pile. They can do some pretty awesome measurements. Um, from what I've seen, the drone technology uh, for a farm to purchase one, they've got to be like 600 cows or more for it really to make sense for a farm to purchase one. Uh, but they have really neat software and there are more nutrition companies out there that are getting them and making it um, available for their customers. So really fun technology. Thanks for bringing that up, Heather. Um, you guys are great supporters. So I, I really thank you for being on today. Uh, so how long will my feed last? So our time to depletion when it's going to be out equals our feed inventory, how much we have in the bunk in tons divided by our consumption rate or our tons per day. So for an example, there's 100 tons left. We feed two tons a day, 50 days for that feed to run out. Simple math, right? Um, Dave mentioned this method to help determine our usage of inventory. You can mark the walls over a set time frame and track those tons removed. This definitely helps with, the, with what Dave said with me measuring density and also helping factor in that shrink number that might be variable. Um, Wisconsin has some awesome online tools to help establish and manage your inventory as well. So we'll spread it out the, uh, the things that are helpful to us. So Next, people ask, when should I do a feed inventory? Well, doing it once a year, that's great. But really, in order to get an idea of what's happening throughout the year, we should do it more than once. So right now is a great time to do it. Most all of our forages are in inventory right now, maybe still some corn silage coming in. Um, but doing a feed inventory right now helps us to make projections to see if our consumption rates should be adjusted. Um, we can do it again after the first of the year, February, March, uh, to make midwinter corrections. Um, this, we can adjust our stored density of our feed to improve our accuracy of inventory. And then we can also do it in June or July after our first and maybe second cutting is in um, to give us an early warning of inadequate feed supplies. Maybe if we had to go through corn silage because first cutting was light um, and a chance to further adjust our feed rates. When's the best time to do an inventory? If you haven't done one, do one now. <laughs> um, it is so frustrating as a nutritionist to make changes to a diet time and time and time again. If we can make our corn silage last the, the amount of time we want, we don't have to flip-flop forages. It's better for the cows. It's better for the nutritionists. better for the feeder. It has a set uh, 
way to feed. So, so this brings us to a scorecard question. So I'll read it out for you. Inven with inventory management and control, give yourself a five if your farm measures inventory several times a year. I am so happy when people measure inventory several times a year. Uh, give yourself a three if you do once a year or twice. Um, do a one if your farm measures inventory when we think we're running out. Because that's happened before, right? We're like, ah, oh, I think this is running out of feed like really fast. Um, yeah, we should be doing inventory faster than that. And then give yourself a zero if your farm never measures inventory. So I see a bunch of fives coming in and you guys are pros at this. That's great. It just makes it so much better. I think as an industry, we're getting much better at doing inventory measurements. If you need help doing measurement of inventory, reach out to us. Um, it's something we're really passionate about is helping people dial in what there is for forage intake or for forage and inventory. All right, so to summarize this section. So as Alicia started out with, minimizing shrink and spoilage on your farm can maintain feed quality, which then optimizes cow performance. Proper face management can reduce the amount of shrink and spoilage on your farm. We all know this. We keep a nice tight face. It's going to look beautiful, but it's also going to achieve the goals we want. We know that even with good management, there will be losses associated with shrink and spoilage, but poor management can be extremely costly. Understanding those feed losses and their value can help you make better management decisions. And then inventory management and control will help keep your diets consistent and promote cow performance. So as a recap of the three scorecard questions for this section, uh, take a picture of this if you wanna talk about it or type into the chat your sum of these three numbers. But our bulk density, you get a five if you're greater than 18 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot. For our feed out rate, especially in the summer, our five is giving us greater than six inches per day of face removal. And our inventory measurement and control, my farm measures inventory several times a year. So I'm curious, are there any 15s out there? Type it into the chat if you got it. We've got a 13, that's awesome. Any other numbers rolling in, feel free to type them in. And like Alicia said, these are meant to like, it's it's kind of a competition, right? We all like a little friendly competition, but these give you some areas to work on at your farm to say, okay, I don't know what my bulk density is. I think I know what it is, but I think we can do better. Well, you as a feeder might not have control over that. However, you can work with you, the owner or somebody, the nutritionist to say, actually, I think our feed out rate is a little low because my bulk density isn't as good as it should be. So we can work on inventory and work on our feed out rate to impact that bulk density, um, to make, to improve even though our bulk density is low. So there's a lot of great numbers out there. So thank you for typing them into the chat. All right, our first feeder, or our feeder challenge questions. Determine the tons of feed and inventory of a bunk of corn silage in both dry matter tons and as fed tons. So we'll put this into the chat. Margaret, to type the other ones in. Um, we'll, our length is 140 feet. Our width is 50 feet. Our height is 12 feet. And our density is 15 pounds per cubic foot. And our dry matter is 38%. So we wanna know what is the tons of feed and inventory in this bunk in both dry matter and as fed. So type it in the chat if you want. Um, we'll put it, we will put the question in the chat and that's our first feeder challenge question. Our next feeder challenge question is name three ways to maintain a proper bunk, more critical thinking. Name three ways to maintain a proper bunk. All right, so Dave, have any questions come up in this uh, this section of feed bunk management? No, I've been answering some things in chat, but no specific questions. All right. I guess the one thing I would mention is that uh, when you've got to make these inventory adjust, these feeding rate adjustments, you got to be working closely with your nutrition nutritionist because they're going to need to re uh, calculate the ration. 
to bring it back into balance. If you're reducing corn silage or reducing haylage or whatever you're doing and making those adjustments. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So next up is the day one wrap up. So Alicia is going to lead this section. Great. So I see that a lot of people have been putting their answers to their scorecards and uh, the feeder challenge questions in the chat box, which is awesome. So let's go ahead and uh, recap those one more time. If you have other questions, please take this time to throw them in the Q&A section and we will have some time after we recap the feeder challenge to go through those. So uh, as Betsy just mentioned, for the bunk face management, ideally we wanna have bulk density of 18 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot or greater. So give yourself five points. Your feed out rate, ideally you wanna have six inches or more per day in the summer that is, and give yourself five points for that one. And then inventory measurement and control, give yourself five points if your farm measures inventory several times a year. Uh, and go ahead and give yourself the appropriate points if you are at one of these other levels. Okay, and then for the feeder question, the first one being from the dry matter section, the question was to name three instances when you should sample forages for dry matter. And there are obviously a lot of uh, solutions that you could have come up with, even though we only asked for three. So answers could include whenever there is a change in forages, monthly or weekly, if there's new cuttings in the bunk, uh, changes in silos or bunks altogether, if there's a rain event, if there's snow melt, or when you notice that there's too much or too little feed left over. Feeder challenge question number two. It rained hard overnight and your TMR tracker software isn't working correctly and you need to make a forage dry matter correction. The corn silage pile in the system is at 38% dry matter, but you just measured it to be 32% dry matter, and you normally add 4,000 pounds of corn silage to the mix. How much corn silage should you add to the mix today to correct for the dry matter changing from 38 to 32%? And I know I saw a lot of correct answers coming into the chat throughout the section, so uh, good job if you came up with 4,750 pounds of corn silage. And remember, you're getting that by multiplying that 4,000 pounds by 38%, which is going to give you 1,520 pounds of dry matter. And then you're going to divide that by 32% to get the 4,750 pounds of as fed. The next feeder question was to determine the tons of feed and inventory of a bunk of corn silage in both dry matter tons and as fed tons. And we gave you the parameters. And so hopefully working through the math, you've multiplied the length, the width, the height, and the density to get this 1,260,000. And then you're gonna take that and divide it by 2,000 to get 630 dry matter tons. And then you're gonna take that 630 and divide it by that 0.38, which represents the 38%. And ultimately you're gonna have approximately 1,658 as fed tons. Feeder question number four was to name three ways to maintain a proper bunk. Again, uh, there was more than three answers. so. Uh, good job if you came up with more than three, but you want to make sure that you're having a tight face, that you're not pulling down any additional forage, that you're pulling off tires and tarps evenly, you're removing tarps and tires more frequently, um, you're weighting down any sort of leading edge, and then you're removing spoilage daily and removing enough feed off the face to keep it fresh. So making sure you're hitting that ideal feed out rate. 
So with that, uh, we would like to say thank you and we will be answering questions in the chat. Dave, um, do you so have some here, questions for us? Yeah, here's a question that came in. Should the bulk density be the same for corn silage and haylage as far as our goals? So I'll jump in um, and Dave, you can tell me your responses. I want my dry matter density to be as high as it can. <laughs> Um, we're gonna, we want to minimize oxygen as much as possible. Um, the caveat to that, I suppose, is, you know, sometimes if we have a drier feed, it's really hard to get high uh, densities because it just doesn't pack as well. So, you know, I suppose you can get both of those with both corn silage and haylage, um, but I'm gonna want them to be as high as possible. Dave, what do you wanna add to that? Yeah, I would, I would agree, although I guess I would say it's typically a little easier to hit those high densities with corn silage. Right. You have a denser feed, it's, uh, it's easier to spread out. Um, haylage a lot of times will roll up on you, it layers, and if it gets a little bit too dry, it's difficult to really pack it well. But we'd like them both to be hitting that 18 pound of dry matter per cubic foot mark, but it's certainly easier uh, with corn silage and with haylage. Yep. I would uh, also like to add, uh, Dave mentioned that the density is going to be different on the top of the bunk versus the middle or the bottom, but it's also going to be different on the shoulders. So if you think about packing that bunk with the tractor, you don't get as close to the edges, um, or you shouldn't get as close to the edges also, and it gets a little scarier, so more people tend to drive over the middle uh, more often. So your shoulders to a bunker or even a bag, especially a bag, because it, um, depending on how the bag is filled, uh, the tops and shoulder or the sides, upper left and right quadrants might be a little bit less dense than either the center of the bag or the middle of the bunk. Yeah. So, so here's another question. If I measure dry matter one day at 35%, and the next day it's at 40%, is the best way to input the dry matter into my feed watch to is to meet in the middle at 37 and a half percent. Yeah, I'll grab that. <laughs> so that one goes along. I saw another one come into the chat that says, can you check dry matter too often? We do it daily. Um, and so I think these two questions go hand in hand because we can drive ourselves crazy, right? Chasing something. <laughs> so that brings up the point of do we and Dr. Kristen Reed at Cornell University talks about this as well. Do we keep a running average of what our uh, bunk is in dry matter? So if we're doing dailies, we can take what today's is and average it with the last 10 days. And that's what we're gonna use. Um, so this 35 today and the next day it's 40. So is there a reason why it's 40? Is it, is, was there a visible thing we saw in the bunk that it changed? Um, is it a different cutting in there? Like if there is something believable that you see that's a rain event or something um, that we go with a 40, but if it's 35 today and there's no explained reason why it's 40, yeah, probably I'm gonna meet in the middle and average it to the prior one. So we're gonna come up with a new average. Um, that, that is, uh, I guess the one thing I would say is that's a big difference, 35 to 40. Right. And I would ask some of those questions. Do, did we get a good representative sample? Mm -hmm. uh, did something happen when we dried it down that we that threw our numbers off? Do we need to recheck it? Um, something's going on there. And, and maybe it was a real change, but like Betsy said, if, if there actually was a change that took place, that's fine. Uh, but if it's because of some kind of an error or a sampling error or a measurement or something, um, there's nothing wrong with rechecking you know, you get a number that seems quite unusual, get another sample, be sure it's a good one, do it again, just to confirm. Okay. There was one other one um, that was about inventory management for ag bags. Do you think it's worth monitoring? So Dave, do you want to talk at all about ag bags and managing inventory? Well, I, I guess I would say it's certainly worth monitoring. And the thing with ag bags is it's probably, you're never going to probably get that above 18 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot. It's just about impossible. Um, the one thing about ag bags is just think of it as a, is a skinny, tall, upright silo. That feed is going to come out of there in the opposite uh, way that it went in. 
so the quality of that feed can change depending on the field it came from. As the day goes on, the dry matter can change. Um, it's likely that the pounds of dry matter per 10 feet, per 50 feet or whatever is gonna be pretty similar. Um, but I guess it's certainly worthwhile. And, and again, you can kind of keep track by saying, okay, on such and such a date, here we are. And how many feet did we go back in a week or 10 days or two weeks uh, to see um, how things are progressing and then make adjustments if you need to from there. And again, work with your nutritionist to make adjustments to that ration. Because if you're increasing or decreasing that particular forage uh, to um, balance your inventory out, uh, you're likely going to need some changes in the ration. So your nutritionist is need, going to need to know about that and to reformulate things. But definitely worth doing, no, no doubt about it. And I guess I would say upright silos and egg bags, even more and more critical to keep track of dry matters and the uh, uh, forage analysis because the changes can be a lot more dramatic and, and, and quickly. All right, another question that just came in, is it worth uh, using oxygen barriers? My personal opinion, absolutely. <laughs> the, just the testimonials from farmers that spend the extra money, they're already doing everything correct. They're putting a lot of packing, um, they're sealing the walls off, they're doing tight faces. They still find a value in using the oxygen limiting barriers. Um, you know, if, it, it goes back to that slide that Alicia shared. Um, poor management <laughs> is always going to experience a lot of losses. It maybe it will help the poor managers, but it it certainly helps the good managers too. So here's a, here's another question: uh, Is there a rule of thumb for changing dry matter of feed that is defaced, and then you get a weather event? So say it downpours shortly after you deface, and it rains all morning. What do you do? So that's uh, that's not an uncommon thing. Um, and of course you can drive yourself nuts doing dry matters and trying to get a good sample. Um, if you typically put three buckets of corn silage in to hit the weight um, that you need and it's rained and stuff has gotten wet, well, guess what? What did Betsy say? When it's wetter, the weight goes up. It's heavier, there's more water. Well, maybe you're not gonna check, try to check the dry matter. It's gonna be wet on the top and it won't be so wet in the bottom. What I would do is I would put in the same volume that you put in the day before, put in those three buckets. It's gonna be a higher weight, there's no doubt about it, but you're gonna probably hit it pretty close. Um, what is the, the best way to judge bunker density? For instance, last year we had 40 pounds wet or as fed per cubic foot or 11 pounds dry matter per cubic foot as we harvested wet corn silage before killing frost. The face looked pretty solid. Dave, you wanna answer it? Well, again, you can use, and you probably don't have it yourself on the farm, but your nutritionist may have one of those tools from Dairy One uh, to drill into it. Um, the one method that I like, like I said, is to mark the wall on each side, keep track of how much, uh, how many pounds of as fed feed you've fed for, if it's 10 days or two weeks or three weeks, uh, know the volume that you've used, know the dry matter, and mathematically you can calculate uh, what the density is um, per cubic foot. Uh, 11, 11 pounds is fairly low. We need, to, we need to get those numbers up. There's no doubt you're likely getting a lot of uh, fermentation losses if you're running at about 11 pounds. We need to get that, need to get that up. So that's an area to, to work on. All right, and the last one I see up there, related to oxygen barriers, which ones are the best? Um, I don't really have a preference, and I, I don't know if I would go on record saying I had a preference for one. Dave, do you want to, or, or Mark or Alicia? I would, say, I would say one with some research behind it. Yes. It has some proven, proven, um, yeah, proven research that it proves that it works. Um, there's a lot of different oxygen barriers out there, all different colors. There's different thicknesses. There's different types that are attached to the black and white plastic that are not attached, all kinds. But you wanna make sure that you can find some research and some studies, unbiased ones that um, prove that they actually work because they can be fairly expensive and you wanna make sure that your investment um, is worth it. That's a great answer, Margaret. <laughs> 
We're, we are not, uh, I guess, in the business of promoting one product over a number. There's a lot of good ones out there. I think the first one on the market uh, had the name Stop in it, just uh, for your reference, and that's a good one. And there, like Margaret said, there's a lot of good ones out there. Just be sure it's got some uh, some good research behind it, and it's going to do the job. So. All right, to wrap up, um, for those that sent in emails into the chat or in the Q&A, we've got them. We will send you the PDFs uh, in the coming weeks as we get uh, everything done. The recordings will be made available. If you want to view them, we'll be po um, posting them on our YouTube pages. And then Libby also put in there the short feeder tip video included today as a part of a series found in the link in the chat. So thank you so much for viewing in today. We'll be back on Thursday, same time. Uh, for day two, where we're going to do feed bunk management. We're going to hear from uh, Dr. Bill Stone with Diamond V on troubleshooting mixer wagons. We're going to talk a little bit about safety. So at the end, when you X out, you should get a survey. Um, please give us some feedback. We love to hear that. So thank you so much. We will see you on Thursday.